the mind is always active, always creating things. You see this clearly when you start to meditate. You're supposed to stay with a breath, and all of a sudden you find yourself thinking about other things, getting absorbed in other thought worlds. And it doesn't take you too long to realize that you've created those thought worlds and then fallen for them. Forgetting that they're creations, things that you're making up right here in the present moment. You think about the past, and it seems very real. You speculate about the future, and it seems very real. And you can get yourself really intrigued, really upset, totally involved in those thought worlds. And the problem is they make you suffer. Either because you start imagining things that really are scary, upsetting, or because you imagine things that are really nice and then they start dissolving away. And after all, the question should become, why keep creating these things? And it comes down to the fact the mind is afraid of what would happen if it weren't creating these things. Either fear of boredom or a deeper fear of nothing, nothingness, let's put it that way. And one of the things we have to do as we meditate is learn how to overcome that fear. Otherwise you'll be continually lost, continually wandering around, and continually making yourself suffer. So the first thing the Buddha has you do is create a good place here in the present moment. Right concentration is a creation. It's made out of directed thought and evaluation, which count as sankaras, or fabrications of the mind. It's focused on the breath, which is a bodily fabrication. You're dealing with perceptions and feelings, which are mental fabrications. So what you're doing is taking this process of fabrication and turning it from a cause of suffering into a path to the end of suffering. How is that? Well, to begin with, you create a state of mind that is very clear. And as stead steady as you can make it. And you find that you, by staying with the breath, you can create a sense of ease. You can create a, a sense of fullness. Just by keeping your focus steady, just by adjusting the breath, paying careful attention to what the breath is doing, paying careful attention to what the mind is doing, and learning how to disband anything else that comes up, either by not paying attention to it or just simply taking it apart. One of the advantages of working with the breath till you get a sense of ease throughout the whole body so that your awareness can spread through the whole body as you begin to see thought formations as they begin to take shape. It's a little stirring right on the border between what seems physical and what seems mental, right there at the breath. And then you begin to see how the mind goes out and clamps a perception on saying, well, this is a thought about this and this is a thought about that, and then goes riding with it. And you learn how you can stop that process, stop it in its tracks. As soon as that little stirring or disturbance appears, just breathe right through it. You can zap it, and it can go away. It's like a frog sitting on a, 
on the lily pad or a lotus leaf. The insects come in from any direction, the frog zaps the insect. And that way we, you create an insect-free environment around you. And there's a space in the mind that's free of anything that's going to form into a thought world. There may be little stirrings, but you catch them in time so that you don't lose your frame of reference. And ultimately all that remains is the perception that maintains your state of concentration. The perception of the breath is what you hold on to as you go through the various states of jhana. As the breath gets more and more refined, finally settles down and grows still, and then you have this sense of still breath energy filling the body. The mind is still enough so the breath grows still as well. In other words, when the mind is still, the brain is losing, using less oxygen, and the need for a lot of in and out breathing grows less and less. And when the breath stops moving, then your sense of the body begins to turn into a mist. Nothing's moving, so each sensation can stay right where it is and begin to perceive the body as being like a fog, little droplets of sensation floating here in space. And you realize that when you let go of the perception of form, it really alters how you experience the body sitting right here. You could apply to a form, you apply a form to it if you wanted to, but you don't have to. It's up to you. You see that you've got a choice. The same goes with holds true for all the different levels of formless meditation. Infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, neither perception and non-perception. Each is something you fabricate. You make up your mind to go there or not go there. And that's an important insight. But the insight grows really deep only after you've been with these things for a while. When you get very familiar with them, that's when you can take them apart. If you take them apart before they're solid, it doesn't have much impact on the mind. But when you've learned how to depend on them, having a sense that you can go to that sense of, say, the still breath, or space, or consciousness, there's a great sense of ease, a sense of being at home. Only then is it effective to take it apart. And there are various ways of taking it apart. One is simply to see that it is fabricated. Another, as the Buddha said, is to see it as a state of emptiness. And he teaches emptiness in two ways. One is learning how to appreciate each level of concentration for the fact that it is empty, it is void of the disturbances that were present in the level of concentration just above it. The image here, of course, is settling down. In other words, in other words when you move to space, it's free of the disturbances of form. You learn to appreciate that. And you learn to realize that the reason you had those disturbances of form was because of the perception, and the perception was a choice. You can choose the way you perceive this field of awareness you have here, the perception you apply to it, and that's going to influence how much you feel a sense of disturbance or a sense of dis-ease, stress. That's an important insight. You experience stress because of a choice you made. And that can lead to a sense of disenchantment with the whole thing. A 
another way of using the teaching on emptiness, is to realize that none of these things are really you or yours. After all, they're a construct. And if they're not you or yours, well, what, what is it? It's just each level is just a state of absence or presence of stress. Nothing more than that. Nothing really romantic, nothing really intriguing. Just stress. Coming, stress, going. That's all. Again, the purpose here is to induce disenchantment, because when you get disenchanted with a thing, then you feel less and less like creating it, continuing it, keeping it going. As the texts say, from disenchantment comes dispassion. And because each of these states are created, is created, then when you feel dispassion for it, you stop creating it. That's why dispassion is coupled with cessation. The image we usually have of letting go is that we're holding something in our hand, and when we let it go, we put it down. The thing is still there, it's just that our hand isn't carrying it around anymore. But a better image would be of the games you played as a child. When you got involved with them, when you were passionate for your game, the game can continue, the make-believe would continue. You build a little house out of mud, and it really is a house, as far as you're concerned. You create all kinds of stories around it. Or you can engage in all kinds of make-believe. But as soon as you get disenchanted with it, you stop. And where is the make-believe? It's gone. If there still was a little mud thing there, it's not the house it used to be anymore. It's just a clump of mud. But you're released from the make-believe. That's the important part. As for the stories, they end, and when they end, they're gone. This is why the experience of release teaches you a lot of things you wouldn't have suspected. As many things that seem solid seem real, were there simply because you were making them up. And when you stop making them up, they're gone. Even states of infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness. Once you stop doing them, they're gone. This is what the Buddha calls the experience of awakening, is the cessation of the six sense spheres. Because when these things stop, you see what's we see what there is to see. And then when you return to the dimensions of space and time again, it's like that little mud house. It's there, but it's not a house anymore. The make-believe is gone. And the suffering that comes from the make-believe is gone. This is why dispassion is coupled with cessation and release. You learn to see what you've been doing, and you learn to stop. So this is what the practice of concentration is for. This is what the teachings on emptiness are for. To loosen up a lot of your associations, that the things you perceive, the things you experience are a given. something that you're not responsible for. You begin to see where your responsibilities really lie, and how much you are responsible for your experience. It's because you are responsible for it, that's why you can gain release from it. 
from all the suffering that you've been creating. So you can look at this as a process of deconstruction, but it has, it's deconstruction with a specific purpose for putting an end to suffering, and particularly the suffering that you've been creating. It's deconstruction handled skillfully. It's like a hammer. Some people take the process of deconstruction, and it's like a little kid just getting a new hammer. You take it and you just bang everything in sight break up everything in sight. Which doesn't really help much. Just deconstruction for the purpose of destruction. But here it's used very precisely for a very specific purpose. When the Buddha started his teaching career, he started with the Four Noble Truths. And he really meant it. This is what he was going to be teaching for forty five years boils down to two things, suffering and the end of suffering. All his tools are for that purpose, and when we use them for that purpose, then we're using them properly. And we'll get the benefit for which they're meant.